Welcome to Art of Health and Wealth. Today we're going to be speaking to Dr. Darville Mills, who is one of my oldest friends from when we met at the Royal Ballet School 24 years ago. I don't know why they call it the Royal Ballet School, because it's actually a college where we graduated three years later. And oh my God, that seems like a long time ago. After graduating from the RBS, Jo went on to train at a contemporary dance school and she danced professionally throughout Europe. Jo was then accepted into med school at the age of 34 and started a career as a junior doctor just before the outbreak of the pandemic of the coronavirus. I'm sure you'll agree that this lady is one of a kind. Jo, sir, welcome to Art of Health and Wealth. Hello. <laughs> so it feels a bit strange for me to be calling you Dr. Darville Mills. Um, so I will be calling you Joseph from here on in. Um, so Joe um, is on the front line um, working at a hospital um, as a junior doctor in Yorkshire. So what can you tell us about your experience of COVID at your hospital? So, I, yeah, I was, I was thinking about, about this question. So I think for me, the, the biggest impact has been that you, you have people coming in with all sorts of things. You have people coming in with COVID and with a sort of non-COVID um, issues. And a lot of people come to hospital with shortness of breath and a cough. Um, and it could be lots of different things. It's not necessarily only COVID. Um, everyone that comes in with those symptoms, we have to treat as if they, they do have it until we have a negative swab result for them. What this means is that you've got a, a many elderly and vulnerable people who have come into hospital and have been isolated in a side room. And um, we've been wearing all of the protective gear and, and everything um, with the visors and a mask and, and everything. And um, I don't know, I think it's the, the emotional impact of it is really brought home to you because the, these, you know, you, you get these elderly people who get very distressed um, about the fact that they don't see anyone, that everyone they do see, they can't see their faces properly. And it's very disorientating. And um, when you're already ill, and it's, um, it can make you quite confused when you're older. And, and that, in addition to everybody coming in wearing all the stuff, it's been, it's been quite distressing for, for me as a, as a medic, um, trying to sort of, uh, calm those people down I suppose yeah. and to have that human yeah. contact that they need to um to make it better because they're so they're absolutely terrified and so mm. that that's been personally I found that quite challenging um yeah. to to deal with so I think that's the something that took me by surprise really um when this when this started I didn't I didn't expect that to be the thing that that really upset me but, but yeah. it is yeah, I can imagine. So are you finding that you're having to spend a lot of your time consoling people um, and, you know, being more also, you know, not just being a doctor, but being um, someone that console people and reassure people. Um, do you, are you finding that you're having to refer people for mental health specialists as well as? Well, I mean, I, I think this is the, the, the lockdown and everything. Um, mm associated with that that there's going to be a, a huge uh, amount of mental health issues i think that yeah. are going to come out of that about people being so isolated and um that sort of you know, uh, that that's also affected people is the fact that we can't have visitors at the moment so hospitals have been oh, right. completely um locked down in terms of having visitors yeah. um, allowed in because obviously we, we don't want people bringing infection into the hospital so but what that means is again you have people who um when their families come and visit it's sort of it, it grounds you and it um it is emotionally it kind of stabilizes people and the fact that people haven't been able to come in again people have become very confused and um really upset because they can't see their family so yeah um, i mean what we've done is we've um we make sure that they get to call their family and we've actually got some iPads now so they can do uh, FaceTime calls and uh, I think with the easing of the restrictions that's happening at the moment um, we're beginning to get a few you have to make an appointment and, and a few people are allowed to sort of come in but we're, we're limiting numbers still at the mm. moment but yeah but I think all of that the, the human side of it and the mental health side of it actually has, has been um, quite quite a large uh, element of, of dealing with this with this crisis actually. yeah yeah 
Okay. Um, so next question. Um, I've tried not to watch the main news because I just find that it really plays on my mind a lot. Um, but at the same time, I have had more time to be on social media. And in being more on social media, I've still seen the news and also seeing a lot of conspiracy theories that are out there. Um, have you had time to listen to any of the conspiracy theories? What's your take on them? Um, like for example, Bill Gates' vaccine and there seems to be one about him creating the whole virus just to sell vaccine and, and things like this. So what, what's your take on that, Joe? Perhaps. I mean, I, do, I don't listen to conspiracy theories. I, they, they are exactly that, conspiracy theories. And um, the, it's, for, I've got my news from the, from the scientific publications because I get quite, quite a few that come into my inbox from um, yeah. various sort of um, uh, areas, so sort of BMJ and um, the sort of academic stuff. And so that's where I've been trying to get my, my information from. And... Uh, as far as I can tell, there's nothing untoward about this. Is this is a pandemic? It's a it's a virus that has um, kind of evolved, and now we're trying to deal with it. So I don't think that I have. I don't really give much time to the conspiracy theories, to be honest with you. I just don't. It's not really something that I I think is worth spending any time looking at. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Short, short and sweet answer just ignore it yes. <laughs> it's a load of rubbish <laughs> it's the it's um the, it's the noise that surrounds yeah. it it's not the, yeah. it's not the real issue i think it, it um distracts us from what the real issues actually are yeah absolutely okay um and do you believe that we should be taking this vaccine as it's been being produced so quickly i don't I don't know um, where it's being manufactured or whether it has been um, finalized even at the moment. Um, at the, we're actually now in June 2020. Um, so what are your thoughts on them creating such a quick vaccine? Well, from what I can see, I think it was a group in Oxford that were um, creating the vaccine and they've actually been working with uh, coronaviruses prior to this particular mutation. Yeah. Um, and, and so they were sort of poised, ready to, to, to make it. And I think they had quite a lot of success with it. Um, all vaccines, I mean, especially in this, in this country, have to go through a very strict um, testing uh, in order to become suitable for, for widespread use and, and possibly more so with this than any other vaccine because um, it's going to be used so widely. So yeah. uh, you really have to make sure the safety profile is, is good enough. And so uh, they're, they're, with the way that trials work, there are several phases to trials. I think they've yeah. already gone through the phase one, which is the, the animal phase, um, to check that it's, it's safe. Um, and then you move on to human trials. And I think, I believe that's the stage that they're in at the moment with a small group of healthy volunteers. That's mm -hmm. the next phase. And then after that, then you extend it um, into a sort of larger, larger trial size. So I suppose the point is that, yes, it's, we're trying to manufacture it, quick, it quickly, um, but it's still, the reason why it's taking the time that it takes is because we still have to observe proper scientific process. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't think corners w won't be cut in order to get it out sooner because it has to be safe before it's uh, we're allowed to use it for for everyone. So um, and also people who are older, who are vulnerable, who are who are in those groups with other health conditions, you need to make sure that it's not going to affect those people badly. So uh, so yes, so I think that it's being pushed through quickly by giving extra funds and extra support to getting through those clinical trials but i don't think cut corners are going to be cut in terms of the um the development of the vaccine itself i, I it's illegal basically in this country to, to cut any of those corners so um so it will have to go through proper strict scientific processes yeah and would you like it to be um would you like it uh, to see it being um given to the elderly first do you, do you feel like it needs to be given to children or do you think there's a demographic of the population that needs to get it first? Well, I mean, I think much like the flu vaccine, there are certain um, groups that are more vulnerable to becoming uh, very unwell if, if they contract um, coronavirus. And those groups should be prioritised, as we do with the flu vaccine every year. Yeah. Um, 
you know, certain groups get it if you have an underlying health condition or if you're over, over 65, I think it is. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I think I'm, I'm assuming similar um, priorities will apply, um, but that's not to say that it won't be rolled out for, for everybody as well. But um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know, but I'm assuming it will follow a similar pattern to previous vaccines. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Okay, um, and what's your opinion on the mask, Joe? Do you believe that we should all be wearing masks or just when we're in the hospitals and sort of inside spaces? Like I've seen interviews with doctors in the States and they're saying that masks are only used to protect patients. So if you wear a mask, it's just going to stop you from keeping your immunity up to other things. And what, what's your take on the masks? <laughs> So, uh, so I was looking at um, the advice for this and, and what we should be doing. So we, yes, we wear, wear masks in, health, in a healthcare setting. Um, that's a lot of the time, it's because we can't socially distance. So socially distancing is the best thing you can do in terms of yeah. not contracting the virus. Staying two metres away from someone is as good, if not better, as, as wearing, uh, wearing a mask. So masks are really for situations where you can't, do that so if you're on public transport or if you're uh, in a confined space or if like us you're at work and you're around people that may have the virus um, so we have specialist masks that we wear for um, when there's something called an aerosol generating procedure so that's when um, something is, is sort of coming out and you're more likely to get virus particles in the air and that's a special mask that um filters the, the air as it as it comes in from ffp3 mask and those are really only used for aerosol generating procedures you don't come across that in normal life that's that's not something that you normally come across i think the guidance and um, there's new guidance actually that's just come out from the world health organization um on yesterday the 5th of june um and um that does advocate wearing masks in public if you can't keep away from people and so uh, they have some recommendations for how to make your own masks um which are really good in it they have um they have a whole section on the science and, and everything that, that underpins it as well and it's a really good um description i think of, of, of the facts surrounding it and it's it's not it's have it has everything else stripped away and it's just the facts and what you can do and so i would i would direct anyone to the world health organization uh, guidance if they um on masks if, if they're interested in, in okay. getting a clear clear picture okay and what i'll do is i think I'll... There is a, there's been a lot of opinion and there's been changes of opinion with this and um i think initially it was felt that because masks were needed for the health service that we didn't want people to be buying up all of the masks that we need, needed for the health service basically um, so so I think that's where some of the confusion occurred um, also they're single use the masks that we use for the health service so um, if everybody was to use them it would cause a huge amount of waste and a huge amount of pollution so actually um, I'm, I'm quite encouraged by this new uh, move to, to making um, disposable masks so okay. uh, so yeah so it, and they've got hot instructions on what sort of material you should use and, and stuff like that so I would say it some pretty pretty good guidance okay cool so what i'll do is i'll put the link to that um web page from the world health organization in the show notes below so anyone can have a look at that okay that's great um so where did we get to um do you think there will be a second wave with the virus and if so do you think it will be worse than the first wave or more self-contained now that we know how to contain it so this is a tricky one so there's there's lots of unknowns so um as my personal opinion this is not a professional opinion my personal opinion is that there probably will be another wave mm. um i think especially considering um the fact that people have been out protesting this weekend so i think that there's been a lot of people in a confined space and chances are there's there's going to be uh people who've contracted it again so there, there will probably be a, a second wave because of that and there's other factors that feed into whether there's going to be a second wave so immunity is one thing so at the moment we do not know about immunity we do not know if everybody produces antibodies after having the virus so we don't know um uh 
how long that immunity may last, even if you do develop antibodies. We don't know how long those antibodies would last for. And there's research being done on that at the moment, but we don't know. Mm. That impacts on the second wave, because if you don't develop immunity, then the minute that you go out again, you're going to contract it again. Yeah. Um, we suspect that you do have antibodies to it, but we, we don't know. At the moment, we don't know how long that would last. So then if we don't know how long immunity lasts for, we can't predict when the next wave is, is going to be. Mm. So that's one thing. The other thing is that if you can develop immunity to it, um, it's the proportion of the population that have been exposed and that have developed those antibodies. And at the moment, I don't think a large amount of population have, from preliminary data, really been exposed. So I think maximum 10 percent i think um okay so uh so yeah so that wouldn't be enough to create the herd immunity that people were, were talking about so yeah. there's a lot of unknowns there basically we need much more information we need more information about how long immunity lasts for when mm -hmm. you have contracted it mm -hmm. um and we need more data about what percentage of the population have been affected and may have antibodies and that's what the in the news they're talking about the antibody test and that and that's what that will enable us to do is to, to look at that data okay. yeah. and, and get a better idea about if and when there will be a second wave I know that um, at the beginning people were talking about the 1918 flu pandemic I don't know if that's something that you've been looking at so um, it's probably worth mentioning that flu is different to coronaviruses and um, it has from what I'm aware, reading in the in the literature, you probably want to fact check this, but um, but I think it, flu is has is more likely to mutate than uh, coronaviruses. So okay. I think mutations, which is why you get a different flu jab every year because it, it's a different strain that comes mm -hmm. around every year. Okay. Um, so uh, so yeah, so from that perspective, I think what happened with the 1918 flu pandemic is there was a mutation in the virus. And um, the second wave was worse than the first wave because it affected young people who had a sort of overactive immune response to it. And it was that immune response that, that meant that lots of people died and, and younger people died and, and more people, basically. So the second wave was worse than the first for, for that particular reason, because of the particular mutation of the virus. Right, yeah. okay. Um, as I said, coronaviruses they're keeping an eye at the moment on the different mutations that that happen it, i don't think it mutates as quickly as flu so right. um, so yeah so that's yeah. that's, th that's, that's where the scare mongering has come from because because the, obviously in the previous pandemic that there, there was a second wave um mm. so i think yeah i think there probably will be another rising infections whether it'll be yeah. another wave or not is another question but i think there'll be another rise in infections and um, purely because when we ease lockdown people are going to be moving around and yeah contract it and not everyone's been exposed yet so that that sort of stands to reason yeah yeah absolutely and do you do you think there's ways in which people can prepare their bodies for that ex that second wave and helping their immunity in their body what what would you suggest as a doctor to so well, for, I mean, I would say if you don't want to catch it, then observe social distancing and wash your hands, which is what the, the official message has been. And that is that 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 is true. So I know people are fixated on hand washing, but actually the virus has a lipid layer on the outside, which is fat. Um, and so soap dissolves fat. So if you wash your hands, it's going to get rid of the any virus particles that you have on your hands yeah. and often viruses are spread through touching surfaces that have been contaminated so um so if you're out and about you've touched things then you need to wash your hands to to get rid of anything that you might have picked up um, and as i said the social distancing staying away from people is um really effective because it's too far for the virus particles to travel um yeah. so uh, so that's in order to to not catch it that's one thing um in terms of immunity i think that um i mean things you can do to boost your immune system is get enough sleep um try and manage stress levels stress can affect the immune, uh, your immune system and eat a healthy diet so eat you know a well-rounded healthy diet lots of nice fruit and veg and stuff and i think those are i mean they're sort of pretty boring suggestions but actually they're they're really something that really does does work so yeah, no, absolutely. So lots of sleep, um, good food and reducing your stress levels. Thank you. I think that's that's really important. So how has this whole outbreak and COVID and everything um, 
how's this shaping your view on where your career will now go in healthcare? Do you think it has at all or will shape your career? Do you think it will um, define where you think you'll go in your, in your healthcare career? Um, I don't know. I mean, everything's been sort of mucked up a little bit um, with yeah. the coronavirus. So we moved from a normal rotor onto an emergency rotor. Um, so we had a different working pattern. Um, mm. Something that we did at, at our trust, which was quite nice, is they put us in teams. So um, we, we had a return to kind of working in teams, whereas before it was um, a little bit more fractured, um, which was really nice. It had a lot of support. And I think there's a, a lot of good stuff that's come out of uh, the way we've restructured for the coronavirus that actually we'd quite like to keep. So um, I think okay. there's, um, there's actually been a, a move to sort of look at what we've done and what's worked and what hasn't worked and, and sort of learning for the, for the future. So I think in terms of the organisation of the NHS, that that's uh, of sort of training within the health service, that's something that's being looked at at the moment. So, I mean, I was very impressed with the speed with which we managed to sort of shift from, from a normal working pattern to this you know, new new working patterns. So I think the NHS did respond really quickly, actually, yeah. and really, really well. I was I was quite quite impressed. Um, I mean, the upshot of this is that, in terms of my training, so as a junior doctor, you rotate round different rotations each. Uh, you do these three different rotations a year, um, and so I basically have not been allowed to rotate onto my last rotation this year. So we went onto an emergency rotor, and now we're going back to our previous rotations because I think we have more experience in that area so in my case I've, um, I was supposed to have a surgical rotation and a lot of surgery has been uh, sort of routine operations have been scaled back so, yeah. um, so there's not as much going on so actually I've been kept on on medicine so it's um it's affected quite quite a lot of the training for for the junior doctors but I mean we rotate around a lot of different areas anyway so it's you know it's only one it's only a couple of months and then we're going to go back into rotating around so so it's affected training to a certain yeah. extent um yeah. in terms of personally I I mean I'm actually quite interested in surgery so um and that hasn't changed with with this so um so yeah I uh hasn't changed my opinion on, on what I want to do but I think maybe for other people it might it you know it's um, a really good experience of dealing with infectious diseases and um, I'm sure that having dealt with this it will kind of some doctors will maybe inspired to go and work with infectious diseases or kind of do other things so yeah. um, so not in my personal case but I'm sure for other people it will have affected their attitude towards what they might want to do yeah cool okay and do you think it's gonna affect how healthcare will be organized and structured moving forward um or maybe i mean i think i'm not obviously not a manager in the nhs so um but i think they are looking at things that have been successful in this and things that have really worked and um, that, i mean there's there's a the nhs is, is going through constant improvement there's a, there's a lot of drives to um constantly improve the service and find areas that uh, need need improvement so um, I think if this restructuring has highlighted any areas that do need improvement then people will be jumping on that and wanting to to improve it so um, so yes but that's all I can say there's a there, there is a real culture of kind of quality improvement and um, getting everyone at every level involved in um, in trying to improve the service so um so hopefully yeah. some good things will come out of this as tragic as yeah. it's, it's been that hopefully there'll, there'll be some sort of lessons learned yeah yeah absolutely okay so we have all been standing outside our front doors um on a thursday at eight o'clock clapping for the nhs and i'm sure i speak for everyone when i say you know we are incredibly proud of the NHS and the work that the doctors are doing every day, seven days a week, all around the clock. Um, how, has, how has that motivated you, Joe, to keep going? And has it inspired you? Have, have, we, have we helped the doctors, <laughs> inspired you and motivated you? You know what, it's, I, it's been really lovely. And especially for me, especially at the beginning, because it was really scary when it first started. You know, you're at work and it's, you know, business as usual. And then suddenly, you know, you hear about this pandemic and there's this sort of mad scrabble to, to get everything 
together and, and it was there were a lot of unknowns at that time you know we, we didn't know how it affected people of all ages we didn't you know know in terms of its severity you know how severe it was going to be and there was it was it was really it was really scary and I was on yeah. call when it actually all sort of started I went in like the beginning of the week there not being anyone coming into hospital because they were scared to the end of the week suddenly being swamped with loads of people who had breathing problems so it was yeah. Um, it was quite a scary transition um, at, at that time and yeah. hearing um, people clapping and sort of that appreciation because you sort of felt a bit like you'd been sort of thrown into it and you weren't psychologically prepared really for it um, actually you know having that support from the public it, it made me a bit it sort of made me well up a bit because it was um, <laughs> yeah it was really it just uh, I think yeah, just knowing that you had people support you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And like, where, where would we be without people like you, Joe? And, you know, just to finish it on that note, um, I, I would really like to invite you back again for, for another show because um, just you as a person trans doing a transition from being a dancer to being a doctor, I think is such a, a wonderful transition. And if it wasn't for people like you that do these transitions in their life, then we wouldn't have these wonderful doctors in our hospitals working around the clock. So, you know, I, I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say thank you so much. You are appreciated. And also thank you for coming on my, my show, one of my first podcasts. And I really, really would like to invite you back again to talk about your transition and how you did that at the age of 34. Um, because I think that story will also inspire people um, in life in general to not be afraid to go through a transition in their life and to really work towards something that they believe in um, and that they aspire to. So... Thank you so much, Jay. <laughs> I know I'd love to. I'd love to come back. I think that's quite an important issue, actually, and yeah. uh, especially for, for dancers um, because your career is short. So, um, so yeah, I would. Uh, I'd love to do that. That's that's great. Okay, well, look, I'm going to end it there, everyone. I will put the show note um, the details for the World Health Organization in the show notes. Jay, thank you again, and we'll speak again soon. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye.